Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafu al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen, khatim al-nabiyyin, ibn al-qasim al-muhammad, wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyabin, al-tahirin, al-ma'asumin, al-lazhi azhabu allahu anfum al-ridza ahli al-bayti wa yutahhirakum tathira. Inna allaha wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala al-nabiyya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to another session of our striving into this beautiful book of life. Um, I hope everyone has been well and uh, we continue with Surah Fatiha. Um, is the sound okay? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, last time in our uh, session, we were doing um, an interesting uh, insight into and we connected it to uh, the last verse of Surah Tawheed in which we discussed the uniqueness of God. And the way we were looking at the uniqueness of God was to see how he is beyond anything and anyone and so it is something that is beyond our imagination and when something goes beyond our imagination then it is something unknown to us and i want to go into this idea of the unknown uh, further today and as you all know we, we've been looking into this book a return to love by marion williamson um, we were discussing about the feminine energy and we gave the example of iron fillings and the magnet and uh, we were discussing how when there is work done from within then you don't need to do so much on the outside as much as to change the inner energy when we change the inner energy we, we start to tap into that higher power who can do everything without effort he puts everything in its place without effort because now we are handing it over to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who is far more, uh, who has far more potential of of doing a wiser, um, you know, outcome for us or a wiser way of doing things than we can. So, it's really interesting uh, what she says here. She says that um, uh, you know we what we do is that we. She says something really interesting about surrender. So we were doing Iyaka Na'abudu, right? And Na'abudu is about being in service. Na'abudu is being about the Ad, the servant who surrenders. Now she says that surrender is really interesting because she says something that uh, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're not entirely surrendered at all times, but we are partially surrendered. So some areas of some of us are more surrendered than others. And she says that everything that we don't really care about that much, uh, you know, we're like, fine, God can have it. But if it's really, really important, then we think we better handle it ourselves. The truth is, of course, that the more important it is to us, the more important it is to surrender it. But what do we do? She says a very interesting example. She says, we keep opening the oven to see if the bread is baking, which only ensures that it never gets a chance to bake. So basically, we, we keep on interfering in the process of handing things over to God. And the way our life is, is like a river that is just running. And whether we interfere in it or not, Allah is handling things and nature is working in a progression that doesn't need human intervention. Nature takes care of itself. The ecology takes care of itself. But what we do is that when something is really important to us, we keep on checking on it. We keep on interfering in it. So where we have an attachment to the results, we tend to have a hard time giving up control. Remember we talked about uh, human addiction and the biggest human addiction is to control. The 
human being having this experience on earth is in a vessel, in a physical realm, is in a physical body that is going through a spiritual experience because we are eternal souls having a very temporary experience on earth. And in order for us to understand desire, we understand control in a desire, right? For example, we were discussing that somebody wants their child to get married. There's a lot of control in it because it's so important and we don't want to give up on the control. So we try to control who my son will marry and how is she and do I approve and do I not and all of those things. We had discussed this. Now for the soul, the desire and control for in our life, desire and control are connected, right? Because when we want something and we're attached to it, that's when we want to control it. And this control and this desire attaches us to the outcome of a certain event in our life. Now, when we work with an intention, when we want to have a pure intention in whatever we do, and we are striving for this purity and we're striving for this um, purification of the self where we want to... Um, align ourselves with the purest intention, meaning the purest destination, meaning um, the finest or the most refined or the highest purpose in life, then that becomes um, finding the divine and purification of the soul. Through the purification of the soul, we are able to find the divine. So in this desire for anything that comes into our heart in this world, there is control of that desire and we forget that pure intention. Just take a pause and absorb this because insan, the word insan comes from the word nisyan. Nisyan is actually referred to a, a, a condition in which you keep forgetting. And insan is somebody who keeps forgetting. So insan is somebody who keeps forgetting his or her pure intention, pure purpose, final destination, final uh, focus of achievement, which is the purification of the soul and unity with God. In this process of forgetfulness, we forget and we get distracted from the main purpose and our purpose keeps going back to what I really want, what, what the me really wants. And the me, the ego, always gets attached to the outcome. And so this is where the control comes, right? And the desires that come into our heart and the dua that we make and the prayers that come from our heart, all of them are part of this process of purification. And sometimes when desires don't come true, it makes us angry. We can't understand the purpose behind that dua not coming true. It makes us angry because we feel frustrated. We can't have control over the outcome. So for the higher soul, for the higher purpose in life, what, what are we trying to achieve out of a dua? What are we trying to achieve out of a desire that is coming to my heart? What Marion Williamson says here is that um, instead of saying, she's giving this example, instead of saying, dear God, please let us fall in love or please give me this job or this promotion, etc. What do we say in the higher, in the higher purpose? What do we say? say? Dear God, my desire, my priority is inner peace. I want the experience of love. I don't know what would bring that to me. I leave the results of this situation in your hands. I trust your will. May your will be done. Amen. So you see the, the shift in the dua is now from seeking something which was on the outside, seeking something which is inside, from asking for a job or falling in love or a promotion, which is all on the outside and outer experience, the dua moves to something which is on the inside, an experience of inner peace, 
an experience of love, an experience of something which is on the inside, the tranquility. And then we detach ourselves from what the outcome will be on the outside, but we attach ourselves to an outcome which is on the inside. And that is the reminder that we need again and again. The reminder to always go within and remember that the purpose is always inner work. And when Allah says that I made the world for you and I made you for me, that means the world is working constantly. Life situations are happening constantly to put us in a place to, to, to sculptor our inner world in a way that the inner is moving towards unity with Allah SWT. And that is how the world is serving us. That is how the difficult situations in life are being meticulously planned. They are being meticulously designed and sent our way so that the inner starts to get purified and moves in the direction of uh, connecting with Allah, finding that unity with Allah SWT. So, in, I'm just going to mute everyone. Um, okay. So, so um, it's really interesting that um, I was reading Marion Williamson's book and she was talking about the idea of this love, right? That love that we seek from within. Um, and then I found a beautiful connection of what she was saying through Ibn Arabi's work. Now, she talks about the surrendered life and I'm, I'm gonna go to Ibn Arabi's work in a minute. Um, she connects the surrendered life and she says that this means that when we think we have things already uh, figured out, we're not teachable. So what she's talking about is that we have to come into a state of surrender and According to Zen Buddhism, she's explaining that um, you have to come into the Zen mind, which is like an empty rice bowl. It's only when the bowl is empty that it can be filled by the universe, by God. But if we have already decided in our mind, if we have already figured it all out and said, this is how I want things to unfold, this is the result I'm seeking, this is what I want, then that means that now there is no room for the universe to teach or, or, or bring its wisdom into our life, its wise result into our life. So what she's saying is that, that when we've already filled and decided, we filled our cup and we've decided, then this means that um, we've already figured things out and now we're not in a place of being taught anything. But genuine insight can't dawn on a mind that's not open to receive. Surrender is a process of emptying the mind. And that's where we have to learn to relax and let go of that control of the outcome. And we need to step back in order so that the higher power within us can step forward and lead the way. And she also continues to talk a lot about love. And she says that if the word God means love and the word will means thought, then God's will is a loving thought. If God is the source of all good, then love within us is the source of all good. Allah says in the Quran that all good is from me and evil is from you. And I always say that everything is from God. If everything is from God, then everything is good. And so evil is only from, from the me, from the ego, from that veil that just separates itself from God. When there's an illusion of separation from the wisdom of God, when there's an illusion of separation from God, even though there's nothing but God, but the illusion, but the veil that I am in some way separate from God, that is going to create the evil. That is going to create the uh, illusion of something, anything being bad for me. So events in our life that bring pain into our life that really, really put us in a place of inner pain and, you know, hurt, they're really happening because there's 
there is a disconnect from God. There's a separation from God. What is this separation? There's a separation from God in understanding that somehow what is happening, this, this event in my life that's happening is somehow outside the plan of God. It's somehow not part of what God had planned for me. Uh, and we, we can have moments, like I said, of moments of forgetfulness in which we separate ourselves from God and think, for example, I, I got fired from my job because my friend told on me or someone betrayed me or I made a mistake. Yeah, even we, when we make mistakes and things happen, they, they're not outside the will of God. So when there's a separation, when there is a, a lack of connection to this understanding that really nothing is outside the will of God, then there's an illusion of pain and hurt because we're thinking this is somehow outside goodness. This is somehow outside the will of God. And so the control comes in. And so we try to take over the situation. And so we feel hurt and we feel pain. Every single time we feel any kind of emotional pain. This is, I don't, I don't want to sound harsh, but every single time we experience emotional pain, remember that that hurt is happening on the tablet of the ego. What I mean by that is that because the ego comes into play, because the surrender is lost for a while and we're going through this, that phase of distraction and forgetfulness, what forgetfulness? The movement away from the pure intention. The hurt comes in. The pain comes in. The emotional pain comes in. I want to explain this. When a situation comes in life, it gives us emotional pain. It's happening because the inner, inner self is now in need of some sort of alignment. I'll give you my example. Every single time I go through a situation where I feel emotional pain, there's a lot of crying. I cry a lot, right? A lot of tears come out and there's a lot of, you know, feeling helplessness and powerlessness. And then, you know, Allah sends reminders through a friend, through a book, through a situation, through your stillness practice or whatever. And in those moments, you get to sit and uh, watch what is it that is causing this pain? Why am I feeling this pain? And inevitably um, I realized that there was a forgetfulness. Forgetfulness is that I have forgotten my main destination and now there's an attachment to an outcome in this world, in this dunya. And when I'm not achieving that outcome, when I'm not achieving what I want, when I'm not getting what it is that I am desiring on the outer surface, in my outer life is when I'm feeling this disappointment. So there was an expectation which broke and now I am feeling this pain of not being able to get what I really wanted or what I was waiting for or was it, I was hoping for. And it's a very painful process because we can't run away from these desires. We can't run away from this uh, need for our expectations to come through. And so this process of pain and then realization and pain and realization is a real process. It's a painful process. Uh, it's a process of purification. And we go through it very regularly. So the forgetfulness comes and then we move back. So now something that can cause a really, really um, fast shift, like an immediate shift in one's thought is to say that, well, my intention is to unite with God, to be surrendered to God, to be like God. I want to become godly, which is the purpose of my life. 
and god is always giving god doesn't take expectations happen when i want to take something when i want someone else to give me something that's when expectations break right and so that's exactly when i lose track of my purpose in life my purpose in life was to be a giver and source is a giver god is the source of everything he's just a giver and so when you shift your mind back to that place of saying i want to be like god i i want to be a giver then suddenly there's a shift why because giving is so easy um not emotionally like not in the real sense giving is so easy because it's so difficult to give because we feel contracted and we're like why should i give why should i give no that is sorry there was some glitch with my zoom uh my apologies for that um so so this this movement between what i really want and what i don't get and my expectations breaking is a place of realization of going back to saying i can easily give what can i easily give i can easily give love i can easily give a smile i can eat i why am i saying the word easily is because it's in my control um it's in my control to forgive somebody it's in my control to be the bigger person it's in my control to um make somebody's day even if other the other person is choosing to be grumpy even if the other person is choosing to uh, laugh at you even if the other person is choosing to hurt you it's in your power and control to not be like that and in that sense it's easy it's easier for me to do something than to make someone else do something you see in that sense it's easier but emotionally it's not easy why should i give i don't want to give i don't feel like giving i don't like this person they did this to me why should i do this for example why should i invite xyz when they never invite me right so it's very difficult but isn't inviting somebody easier than making them invite you 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 can't change their mind you can't change uh, their perception you can't make other people do anything and in that sense doing what you can do is in your power and when we choose to be godly we start to exercise that power that we have and that way we become more empowered because now we are taking a step of making a choice which is in my control and so i let go of the control that i am seeking so addictively to bring out an outcome from another person and i move into a state of be feeling this empowerment that i can now choose to do the good that i des- that i'm expecting from others and so that is the empowered way of of seeking godliness where we come into a place of remembrance i wanted to connect love to this state now we were discussing um masculine and feminine energy for the past few times and um and you know we talked about the feminine energy being the energy of um being and not doing right and what i just explained to you when 
I choose to be the forgiver, when I choose to be the giver, when I choose to be like God, then I am coming into a state of being somebody rather than doing something, right? And I am being, now I'm choosing, right? I'm making a choice of being kind, of being forgiving, of being generous. I am being somebody. And the feminine energy is all about being someone rather than doing something. And doing is something when we are forcing an outcome out of somebody. So the feminine energy then becomes a way of being like God, being godly. And God is love. And being someone is, again, happening when, when we become someone it happens through a sense of remembrance. It happens through a sense of moving out of that forgetfulness. So Ibn Arabi in his book, Heir to the Prophets, talks about, um, in his chapter on prophecy, he talks about the uh, prophecy, the, prof the holy prophet or the prophet that came. So why did the prophets come? They came as those who reminded us, right? They're the ones who remind us. Again, um, I'm connecting a few points, so just bear with me. We're connecting Obudiya, which is servitude, which is surrender, surrendering from doing, but moving into a state of being. And being is a state which we are originally supposed to be in, but we forget, so we need a reminder. And who gives us those reminders is our prophets. So these prophets, they come to us to move us out of this uh, they, they, they come to give us a shift from the atemporal to the temporal and they help us to go into a place of the eternal and the first function of the prophets is to remind people of their own divinely given reality this word remind translates as dhikr so dhikr or reminder comes is connected to a word taskira and tazkira is to remember. And tazkira leads to the word dhikr. And dhikr is for us in, in our circles, the remembrance of God, right? And so the reminder that comes from God calls forth for the remembrance from man. The use of one word to designate a, a movement from the divine to the human and from the human to the divine is consistent with the Quran's unitary perspective and recalls the parallel use of the word love. This is where I wanted to bring you all, this connection of remembrance and love and God. Um, it's a beautiful connection. He loves them and they love him. This is Surah, surah number five, I number 54. Allah is saying he loves them and they love him. And then in surah number two, ayah 152, Allah is saying, so remember me and I will remember you. Remember me and I will remember you. So there's this direct connection between remembrance through a state of being, remembering our purpose and our goal. And when we're remembering that, he's remembering us. And he's saying simultaneously, that he loves them and they love him. And so whether we speak of remembrance or love, there is in fact only one force and that is the divine activity that makes manifest the good, the true and the beautiful. God loves human beings and sends the prophets to remind them that he is the one source of love and the only real goal of love. The doctrine of one and onlyness, Tawheed, is the foundation of the message. But the human response to the reminder does not simply entail acknowledging this truth. To remember God is to awaken to the innate understanding of God's unity, to express this understanding in our language and our actions. If the first function of the prophets is to remind people of the one reality and its love for them, so the idea of the prophets coming to remind us is to bring us back into a state of love. To remember that I need to be godly 
is to remember that I am loved, is to remember that this being that is pulling me towards him, this, this higher being that is nothing but love, and that he's sending me these reminders to come back into a state of love, to come back into a state of goodness, um, is in fact a complete game of love. So what do they say here is that if the first function of the prophet is to remind people of the one reality and its love for them, their second function is to provide instructions that will allow people to live their lives in ways that are pleasing to the reality and worthy of its love. And so we come to the second part of the ayat. Ya kan abdu, ya kan astain. So first we are going into a state of surrender and we are saying, I give up on my expectations. I give up on what I want. I give up on, on what I want to control and bring out in the outer world. But I move into a state of who I need to be. Let me move the focus away from what that person needs to be to waking up and saying, wait a second, I can't waste my life constantly dictating or expecting what other people need to be. That's not my job. My job here is to make sure I do work on myself and become who I need to become. And that is where the, the, the abd, the servant of God, realizes that I need to follow in the footsteps of these people who came to remind me who I need to become. And that becoming of me becomes my own help. And that's where there is an empowerment. I help myself by waking up to the reality of my purpose. I help myself by waking up to the reality of Tawheed. And what I mean by Tawheed here is again, the same thing, that nothing is separate from God, that nothing is away from the meticulous plan of God. So everything that's coming to you, somebody breaking their promise, somebody not living up to their word, somebody backing out on uh, what they were meant to do for you, a plan that was supposed to come through but falls apart, a disease that comes your way, God forbid, or, or any, any calamity, any disappointment, any tragedy that comes our way, it has to be taken in the fold of that Tawheed that this is not out of the plan of God. And when it is coming inside the plan of God, it is only coming for me to now put on my, you know, power suit and say, you know, like Superman puts on his power suit, the Superman suit and says, it's time to get to work. And so, you know, you get to work and you become that it's entered that super state where you're the empowered one. But you're empowered in that state because you have all the power to be who you want to be. You can choose to be whoever you want to be. And it's, it's so empowering because now you're not required to do anything, but you're required to be someone and you just awaken to that. I know I've repeated myself a lot today, but the reason for that is, is something that's coming from a very personal experience. Because what I have experienced that I was explaining to you, that you go through these moments of foggy phases where you forget all of this and you forget your purpose, you forget godliness, you forget who you want to become because that is the nature of this world. That is the nature of how we are designed. When something comes, it, it comes in the form of a trigger. When the trigger comes, you know, imagine when your phone starts to vibrate, what happens? If I imagine like, you know, if, if my recording is coming to you through a phone and my phone starts to vibrate, what's gonna happen? My vision is gonna get blurred out. That's what triggers do. Triggers come like alarm bells and they ring all these bells within us. And when that bell starts ringing, our vision gets blurred. Our purpose, our intention, our destination becomes really blurry for that, that, moment, that time period. And in order to get out of that, what, what they're saying over here, which is what Ibn Arabi is saying and which is what Marianne Williamson is saying, that you come back into a state of remembrance. And to remember God is to awaken 
awaken to this inner uh, knowing of the purpose. And the minute we are able to awaken to that, um, the blurriness goes away. The vision becomes clear. There's an ayat in Surah Araf. I think it's Surah number 102, where Allah says that when a whispering from the Satan comes to them, the believers, they awaken to a light. They, they get insight and they can see clearly. And this is the true practice of constantly coming back constantly returning to the purpose of life. And in those moments when we are triggered, being able to shake it off and go back into that same sense of presence and watch things that are happening around us, watch our thoughts, remembering that the herd is coming from within, not the outside. Now it's a very, very difficult phenomena to accept and to digest and to believe and to give it that serious attention when we are in a state of triggered pain from somebody else because it further makes us angry right imagine if you're in a state of hurt um, somebody just ran away with your money and I tell you well your hurt is from within you're going to be like bs you know like really somebody just ran away with my hard-earned money or my life savings and I'm hurting and I'm mourning and you're telling me that the hurt is from within it's, it's going to trigger us even more but the believer in God who is a who is going to go back to that understanding that everything is from God and everything from God is good and I need to see good in this can easily now know that yes, the, the physical part of me, the human part of me needs time to mourn this and grieve this. And I want to grieve it out. I want to cry it out. I want to vent it out. You know, I, I am feeling really upset and sad. Yeah, that's fine because we have to accept all the emotions. And once that initial stage of grieving and mourning is done as human beings, then we need to be in a place of going and seeing the good in that. And the only way we will be able to see the good in that is when we can get out of the chatter of our thoughts. In this particular situation, for example, when somebody is suffering a loss like that, you can easily imagine the kind of uh, thoughts that are gonna run through our mind, right? For example, uh, what's gonna happen now? Um, how can I bring back all those years of hard work? Who's going to pay my rent? Who's going to pay this? How, how, am I going to, how am I going to fulfill the plan I had already set in motion? Um, nobody's going to come and do this for me, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm ruined and I'm, uh, and, you know, my life is, you know, gone into the dumps. These are the thoughts which are thoughts of the future, thoughts of the past. All the work I did, life is wasted, number one. What's going to happen in the future if I don't get my money back? Thoughts of the future, right? So thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future. And in that moment, if we can now find the courage to awaken to the present moment and be able to counsel ourselves from that place of being the observer and saying nothing is out of the plan of God, and there is something in this that I am meant to see and learn for the higher purpose and growth of my soul. Now, you know what happens is that if you don't counsel yourself like that, and if somebody else comes and says that to you, that there is a higher purpose here and your soul's journey needs to learn something from here, generally, a lot of people would turn around and say, Please stop telling me about God all the time. Please stop telling me about the soul all the time, okay? Everything is not about that. Um, and so there's a resistance to seeing the reality behind the grid of the outer grid, the outer, uh, you know, sir, the outer illusion of this world. And to break out of that illusion and say, no, but that is what it is. It's all the time God. Nothing is bereft of God. Nothing is other than God. No plan is without the wisdom of God. 
And the true awakening is to waking up to this wisdom of God in this particular situation. And I always um, feel like a practice really helps me. Um, of course, uh, you know, uh, forcing yourself to sit in silence, forcing yourself to do some breathing, um, forcing yourself to talk to a wise friend who can bring yourself, knock some sense into you and bring you, you, you back to your senses in a deeper, wiser way helps. Um, but one of the practices that really helps me is an aspiration, uh, looking up to a, a man of God or, or a woman of God and saying, what would they do in this situation? How would they be in this situation? You know, when they're going through some sort of a painful situation, what would, they, what would, what would their demeanor be like? Uh, would, they, would they cry and howl or would they have this calm, peaceful smile on their face and they would say, Alhamdulillah, right? And that kind of brings me into a place of saying, okay, I'm losing my calmness right now. Why am I not in a state of calm right now? Um, let me go back and see where did I lose my peace? And we know this and we hear this again and again where um, we are told and we learn that the outer material world cannot bring inner peace to us. So the, the things that we truly seek and truly desire are the things which cannot be bought with money. They come from inner work. And so every single time when we put an expectation on something that we want and we don't get it, it is actually a desire for being loved, a desire for being accepted and validated. And people's actions are not hurting us as much as our definition around their action that hurts us. So if somebody was supposed to do something and they don't do it, deep down inside us, we feel, wasn't I worth their commitment? Wasn't I worth their time? Wasn't I worth their love? Was I so unworthy? Was I so petty that they didn't even pay attention to X, Y, Z things? It happens with women all the time when husbands forget their birthday, or it happens all the time with women when husbands forget anniversaries, right? It's not about um, that particular action of forgetting that hurts us. It is the narration it is the discourse, it is the conversation within our minds that is attached to that action that hurts us. And if we can separate what the other person is doing and say their act is just an act, that's not if we, if we can come into a place of surrender and accept this, that their act was not exactly what was hurting me, but there was a whole story around that act which was running through my mind that was hurting me, that's when we can awaken. That's when we suddenly wake up and come out of our uh, grogginess, our sleepiness, our grumpiness, and see things. And so... Rasulullah has this beautiful hadith which says, which says um, Oh Allah, show me things as they truly are. You know, um, and that is the meaning of seeing things as they truly are by detaching the thing, by detaching the event, by detaching the action from my story. What is my story? And what my story does is that it taints the action. It, it, I put on a lens of my bias, of my story. And then I look at um, that event or person. And now I can't see what it truly is. Now I can't see the true colors of the mango because I'm already wearing red lenses. If I'm going to see a yellow mango with my red lenses, I'm not going to see yellow. I'm going to see it orange, right? And so what the Prophet is saying in his hadith, in this prayer, is saying, Allah, 
show me the reality the way it is and so our desire for moving towards haq and truth in our everyday life becomes this how can i detach the stro- story from my trigger what is the story attached to my trigger and when you can sit down and reflect upon that story and then become aware of it that awareness will break the negative charge that is attached to our triggers you know i was listening to dr shafali and she was asked this question um what do you think is conscious parenting and dr shafali said that conscious parenting is to realize that you're not really parenting the child on the outside like your offspring your biological child you're actually going through a process of um bringing up your inner child you're actually in a process of healing the wounds of your childhood that is conscious parenting and khalil jibran says that your your children are literally your teachers and the reason he's saying that is because children have the biggest potential of of pressing our buttons children have the biggest potential of triggering us constantly throughout our lives and they will press on the buttons and the minute you get triggered you have to know something in me needs work this is what conscious parenting is so when we can see triggers that change our state that there is an emotional charge that comes up and there is a trigger if we can find the courage to sit and see the story behind that trigger and then separate that story from that trigger we can find truth we can move towards a clarity and a vision which is closer and closer to the haq so i just want to give an example and then end um this talk today um for example um you know your your child um is eating a lot of um maggi for example right the those ramen noodles and you somehow get really really angry like far more than you should be like it really triggers you and you feel frustrated and the child is not listening what do you do you just go back and you sit down and you say what is this why is it triggering why am i not able to communicate to my child about this without the charge without that emotional energy of losing it and you will realize that there must be some event in your childhood there must be some experience in your childhood like your mom never let you eat let you eat it and you always wanted to eat it and you felt like all my friends eat it but my mom didn't let me eat it and that led to a sense of deprivation which led to you feeling unloved that i'm not loved enough i'm not good enough to deserve this which other people have and and this is just an example i'm not giving a real example but this is an example of how there is a story behind the trigger and so in that in that moment of pain um if we for example take out some time in our day every day where we sit and do our journaling our gratitude writing you know reading an ayat of the quran pondering reflection um meditation then what happens is that you're already in a practice of waking up to yourself and when the triggered situation comes up you are already in, uh you know equipped to wake up to that situation and say i need to do some some reflection right now i need to i need to see what's going on and you can uh you know come to a place of watching yourself and watching your thoughts and watching your stories and finding that detachment and the last thing that i want to say is that for the longest time despite the fact that i have studied and researched uh into dhikr and meditation for so many years and um you know i i believe in it uh and i pray it um there was always this question of how does this zikr directly affect my journey into awakening and i recently 
felt that what the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does is that it's like a medicine which enhances the ability to awaken in a state of a triggered state, in a, in a negative triggered state. Um, the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that medicine for the heart. It, it's a medicine that removes the fog in, in a moment of fogginess, in a moment of losing a sense of your direction and sense of your intention. And it literally enables that detachment of the act and event from its story. And that's how the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can purify the heart and take us to the truth because now you can separate your triggers from the stories. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Um, let us now put our hands up for a dua. And once I stop the recording, if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. O oh Allah, we come to you as your humble, flawed servants in need of your love, in need of your attention, and in need of your guidance moment to moment. Oh Allah, we lose our sight. We lose our destination. Our sight becomes blurry moment to moment. We are distracted little children, O oh Allah, and our hope is only in your mercy and in your love and in your caress and in your warm embrace through which moment to moment we find the courage to keep on going. We find the courage to keep moving towards you. If it wasn't for you who filled our hearts with the motivation, with the courage, with the zest for perfection, O oh Allah, we would have never been where we are. We would have never reached where we need to reach. So Allah, take our hands and take us where we need to go. We depend on your mercy. Ya Arhamar Rahim. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.